for me to be a Christian, I don't, I don't care for any other thing in this life because when I die, I'm not going to take anything away. So why should I bank my hopes on the things that, on things that are just earthly and that do not ultimately give me satisfaction? My wife works for a certain um, senior care um, agency and they have a client that my wife is taking care of. This man is, I must say that he is somebody who has made it in life. He has a big company, he has a branch in Germany and then he is at a point of dying. His wife passed about seven years ago. He didn't have any kid. And uh, the wife, the wife passed about some years ago. Right now, the man is at the point of dying. And do you know what has happened? My wife feels very, very aggrieved when families and relatives of this man call him. All that they are interested to know is when is he dying? When is he dying? The doctor has actually given him just a few weeks to survive. And my wife is so, whenever anybody calls him, a relative, a family member calls him, when is he dying? Do you think he can survive the next day? All that they are interested in, when a man dies, they want to grab everything left. And this man, he's, he wants to go. But the question is, where are you going? Where are you going? The person who has no Christ doesn't have an answer to a question like this. But thanks be to God that we who have Christ have an answer. We know where we are going. And that is all that life is about. Amen. So life in this world without Christ is meaningless. It's non-significant. So that is why I feel very proud. And I get up in the morning, I am full of praises to the Lord that I have Christ. I have hope. When I get up in the morning, whether I have whether things are going on well for me or not, whether my car breaks down, whether I have money to pay my rent, whether I have money to pay my bills, whether I have a lot of things going on around me that negatively speak to my speak to my mind. When I consider the fact that I'm a Christian, I have Christ, I'm satisfied. And that is what the Christian life is. So I want to encourage all of us to keep on, never give up. Because the Bible says as long as our labor in the Lord is never in vain, we shall win. Amen. That is not a topic for my, um, my preaching this morning, but I just felt like saying this to you. Let us feel excited. Let us feel satisfied whenever we come to the house of God and fellowship with Him. The Spirit of God is here. And when we were singing a song, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. I remember those days when I committed my life to the Lord. I didn't know what the future had for me. It was very, very difficult to abandon, forsake the world, and to trust in Jesus. But let me tell you this. For all these years that I've served the Lord, I've never been disappointed by Him. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Shall we pray before I start sharing with you? Father, we thank you so much for bringing us together. It is not by chance. It is just by your grace that we have been saved, that we have been redeemed, that we have been snatched out of this world of sin, this world of destruction and brought to you. Thank you for our union and fellowship with you. And for this reason, Lord, you have made us also ambassadors to make you Christ known to everyone in this world. So, Lord, I pray that you help us, continue to help us, Lord, to sustain and maintain our work with you and our fellowship with you. This morning, we've gathered once again your presence. I pray that, Lord, you speak to us. And as I read and share your word with all of us, let it be a source of inspiration to us, a spiritual food for our nourishment. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we turn our Bibles to the book of John, chapter 21? I'm reading from the Gospel of John. 
and uh, chapter 21 and I'll read to you as you follow me with your Bibles and I'll be reading from the New International Version. I'm reading from verse 15, John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than this? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I am talking to you about our love for the Lord, our love for Jesus. And we see a practical demonstration of love in this passage, in Peter's encounter with Jesus, his meeting with Jesus. Jesus had so many ways in which he wanted to know how people expressed their love for him. And in this particular story, Jesus had met with his disciples after his resurrection. Before this time, all the apostles and disciples and believers and followers of, of Christ followed him. They witnessed the miracles he performed. They witnessed the signs and wonders he performed. They witnessed the healing and the casting out of demons in his ministry and so on. They were so devoted and committed to him as a Messiah. Probably they put their trust in him as the hero, somebody who would deliver them from the political operation of the Romans. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is arrested and crucified. And all the disciples were very, very fearful at this time. And for fear of the Jews, they will shut themselves up in a room. And Jesus appeared to them when he resurrected from the dead. When he appeared to them, it was such a surprise to them because they did not even know Jesus had said, I will come back to life after three days. They hardly imagined how that was going to happen because it had never happened before. And it surely happened. It truly happened according to Jesus' own words. So after appearing to them and then going back or disappearing, Peter and the disciples probably did not know what the future had for them. The circumstances, the things that were going on, in their thinking, in their minds, it appeared as if their mission was useless. Their commitment to Jesus was useless. Don't we sometimes think so when things don't, don't go the way we want? The promises we receive from God's word is commit your life to Jesus and it shall be well with you. When Jesus was with them, he worked miracles, he performed miracles, he even fed the multitudes with bread and they were also partakers of that. They witnessed so many things that Jesus had done for them. So they, their expectation was that things were going to continue like that. Enjoying Jesus at all times. Enjoying his miracles. Enjoying seeing the signs and wonders following his ministry. And all of a sudden everything was cut off. 
Don't we think, don't we feel sometimes that maybe things are not what we thought would be? And so all of a sudden, Peter, who was supposedly the leader of the apostle, apostolic team, said, I am going back to fishing. After all, that was my profession. That was what I was doing before Jesus Christ came to me. And I abandoned everything and followed him. Do you remember at one time, Peter was so disappointed, seemingly disappointed with Jesus when he said, if you don't sell everything that you have and give everything that you have in possessions to the poor, you cannot follow me. You cannot be my disciple. And Peter at this time turned to Jesus and said, we have left everything. We have left our families, our possessions. We have left everything, our businesses to come and follow you. What shall we gain at all? And Jesus said, whoever has left everything to follow me will get back everything that he has forsaken in many, many fools. And so Jesus Christ gave this promise, but he said, but with persecution, with troubles and tribulation, so at this point in time, Peter was wondering in his mind, I am going back to fishing because he was very influential, because he possessed some amount of influence over the other disciples. They said, we shall go with you. They all left. And similarly, they abandoned their calling. They abandoned their devotion to the Lord. Their love for the Lord began to weigh down. And so it was at the show. When Jesus met with them, he appeared to them all of a sudden and then he baked bread and ate with them. And while they were eating, after all, it is bread. That's, that's just the bread that you want. It is bread that you want. That's why you left and said you were going back to fish. Okay, take it and eat it. But then that was not enough. He turned to Peter personally and asked, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? He asked the question three times and Peter responded. But Jesus was not satisfied with the first two responses to the question. So he went on and asked the third time. And Peter said, you know I love you. Why are you asking me the third time? You know everything. Now, there are three different meanings to the word love according to the Greek word. Love in the Greek language means a lot of things. It could mean errors. And that is how we got erotic love from. That is the affection or the love that between, is, exists between a man and a woman. And so when someone say, says, I love you, that, is, that intention is that I am attracted to you. And that is different. That is not the kind of love that Jesus needed from Peter. And he asked him the third time, do you love me? That was, this time it was Filio, the filial type of love, a love that exists between families, relations or relatives and so on. But that was not the type of love that Jesus wanted. Peter said, I love you. Yes, I love you. And then he asked him the third time, he said, you know that I love you. And at this time, Jesus realized that Peter had now come to the point of real love. And that was agape love. The love that we develop with the Lord and we want to maintain it. Regardless of all the circumstances that come our way, regardless of the situations that come our way, regardless of any persecution, troubles, whether we lose or not, we will continue to maintain that love for the Lord. Yes. It doesn't matter whether things go well with us or not, we want, we want to maintain that love. And that is what Jesus Christ needed from Peter. Do you really love me? Even in the midst of all these crises, even in the midst of persecutions, even in the midst of troubles, do you want to continue to maintain your love for me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. And Jesus said, okay, then I give you a duty. I give you a charge. Take care of my lambs. Take care of my sheep and feed my sheep. So in this, we see three important things that you and I need to take note of. First, our love for the Lord is something that develops out of our personal relationship with him. I can tell you to love God. The Bible says my love God, but we don't force love on anybody. Can you force love on anybody? No. If you love a person, the person doesn't love you, can you force it on him or her? 
No. Love develops. And so at this time, Jesus wanted something personal with Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? So we develop our love with the Lord out of personal relationship. It isn't something that someone must force upon us. That is why when we preach the gospel, we leave the decision with people to make or to, to determine whether they love God or not. We leave it for the people to decide for themselves. I don't preach the love of God and force it on anybody. No. I preach and I tell you how God loves you and how he demonstrated his love towards you. And it is up to you to make a decision to respond to that love. And that comes out from personal de um, relationship. That is, your develops as out of your personal relationship with God. You have to develop it. And so Jesus needed that from Peter. He said, do you love me? And Peter said, I love you. We develop it. Thank God that when I developed that love for the Lord and I even had to abandon everything and enter the ministry several years ago, I've never regretted. Many things have gone seemingly against me. I've had a lot of troubles and challenges. But my love for the Lord continues to grow day by day. And I will continue to maintain that love because of my commitment to Him. I don't consider the cost involved. The love that I'm talking about endures all situations. And we've had people at different times in church history, right from the days of the apostles, who demonstrated their personal love for the Lord by even dying. And that brings me to the second point. Our love for the Lord is demonstrated also in our relationship with other people. When Peter responded, I love you, Jesus said then, this is what you need to do. Take care of my, my, my lambs. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Peter said, yes, I love you. Then do this for others. And that is a kind of commitment that we have when it comes to ministry. Now, when it comes to love, our love for the Lord is vertical. But at the same time also, it is horizontal. Do you know why I'm saying this? It is vertical in a sense that when we stand before the Lord and we raise our heads up and our hands up and say, Lord, we love you. I love you. You are my Lord. You are my God in worship. And I bring my head down. It is my fellow human being that I see. And that fellow human being whose face I am looking into, whose eyes I am looking into, is made in the image and likeness of God. So I cannot actually love God and hate any other, and hate my fellow human being. And that is what the Apostle John said. If a man claims he loves God, he does not love his neighbor. He is what? A liar. And that is why I commit myself to ministry, to serving other people. The reason why I'm in ministry is that I love God and I have to demonstrate that love by caring for people, ministering to their spiritual needs, praying for them, preaching Christ to them, warning them of judgment, of judgment for sin that is coming, and then letting them know that God loves them, therefore they must run to Him. Yes. That is the commitment that goes with my love for the Lord. Now, the third thing, which is very, very practical for us, is that love, our love for the Lord is also determined by the level of our commitment to him. Jesus, after asking Peter the third time, do you love me? And Peter responded, yes, I love you. Which was the truly agape love. He then told him, when you were younger, when you were younger, you dressed up and went wherever you wanted. But now that you are old, someone will dress you up and then lead you, hold your hand and lead you where you don't want to go. Now Jesus was not talking about, he was not talking about physical growth. In the spiritual sense, Jesus Christ was, used to, was actually speaking in parables. It was very symbolic. Very, very symbolic. It was a figure of speech. It was symbolic of 
how our growth in the Lord takes time and then it also how our growth of the Lord is um, that is is from one stage to the other when a person becomes a Christian at first that person is a new convert but then he she or she tries to grow and develop in the Lord and stay in the Lord until when that person is grown is fully mature to withstand all the situations and circumstances and problems that comes his way or her way and so Jesus Christ was saying now you have grown now you have grown or you will grow but when you grow this is what is going to happen to you someone is going to lead you to a place you don't want to go and by this the apostle John who wrote this said Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was talking about the kind of death by which Peter will glorify God is it a good thing to be told this some of us may not want to hear that following Jesus actually means that I'm going to die for him I better pack my bag and baggage and leave all that we are interested in our lives at this time is that we want to hear good good messages Good messages that promise us of God's blessings and prosperity. Messages that promise us comfort. So, in many people's minds, to follow Christ means to have comfort. To have all the best we want. Yes, God promises us comfort. I am a perfect believer in prosperity. I am a perfect believer in comfort. I am a perfect believer in good things. But the Bible tells me this. That I should seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all other things we added unto me. The Christian life that I live is not just full of good things. There are bad things that will come my way. And these bad things are things that the devil will bring my way. And I can attest to the fact that people that have been satisfied with enduring bad things have had peace in their hearts. People like apostles, all the apostles died shameful deaths, very, very painful deaths. Peter in particular died a very, very painful death. When he was about to be killed and crucified, he said, no, no, I don't want to be crucified like my master Jesus. I want to be crucified upside down. Yeah. Let my head come down. I don't want, I don't deserve to be crucified like my master Jesus was crucified. Crucify me, all right, but do it this way. Bring my head down. And it happened to him. A man called Polycarp, who was an apostle, uh, the disciple of Apostle John. Polycarp served the Lord for several years, several years, several years. He was born into uh, he was born into a home that was very godly and he was discipled by the Apostle John. And Polycarp in church history, when he was arrested and asked to deny his Lord Jesus, he said, for 86 years, in other words, 86 years I've served the Lord and he has not done me any evil. Why should I deny him? And then he was told that you are going to be killed. He said, do it very quickly because I want to go and be with my, my Lord. He said, do it, do it, do it very quickly. Don't waste time. He said, for this confession and this failure to deny your Lord, you are going to be killed. He said, wow. Do it very quickly. Don't waste time. Do it. Do it quickly. And he was put on fire. He, in other words, fire was set on him. He was burnt alive. But you know what? The fluid, the water and blood that gushed out of his body quenched the fire, he never died. So one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced his body many, many times and he died. And after this, one of the soldiers looked at it, very, the one who did this, stood, and he was so much amazed that this man never, he never denied his Lord. What is so special about this Jesus that people are dying for? And so he said, I'm also giving my life to Jesus. And at that point, he was also killed. 
The Bible says the seed of the people or the seed of the martyrs is the seed that the blood of the martyrs is, is the seed of the gospel. Thanks be to God that from time immemorial, the church has gone through persecution. People were in courts, arrested, and brought before the theaters, like stadium, where people gathered in their houses just to watch Christians being devoured by lions. And they will sit there and clap their hands. They will pay money and go to the place and sit and listen and just watch Christians brought to the center of the stage and then the lions, the hungry lions will be opening from their from, from their places and they will come and devour the Christians and the people will be sitting there and clapping their hands. What was so unique about these people? What was so unique about them was that they loved the Lord. They loved the Lord. And like the Apostle Peter, they died shameful deaths in order to glorify God. My word of encouragement to you is this. We are living in hard times. We are living in difficult times. But Jesus is coming soon. The things that are happening around us are sure indications of the end time prophecies. And the Bible says this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Sorrowful times will come. Evil times will come. And what will happen is that many people will have the form of godliness and will deny the power of God thereof. A lot of things will happen in the church. People will compromise their faith. Even pastors will find it difficult to speak the truth from the pulpits because there's a lot of compromise going on. But then, those who endure to the end shall be saved. So I encourage you, Stay on, have your commitment, that keep your commitment to the Lord intact, never give up, stay on very, very truthful and very faithful to the Lord. By all means, your commitment and your labor to the Lord will be richly rewarded. May the Lord bless you and keep you and sustain you. If there's anyone here sitting down, listening to me, at the verge of giving up because we're discouraged and things are not going on the way you your way the way you want. Now just stand firm and say to the devil you are a liar. I belong to Jesus and I'll never give up my faith in him. Amen. Shall we be on our feet at this time? And can we sing the song one more time, Tissot Street, to trust in Jesus, after which I will pray. Shall we be on our feet? Shall we be on our feet, please, as we sing this song one more time?